Thank you everybody for being here. So I want to, wel to welcome everyone here. And as, um, as Dr. Goodrich uh, gives her presentation, if you have questions, uh, please put them in the Q&A. It's a little, little bit easier to monitor questions in the Q&A than the chat, since the chat has so much stuff in it now. But I do welcome you, and I'm, I'm very pleased to introduce tonight um, Dr. Betsy Goodrich. Um, Betsy is a plant pathologist with the U.S. Forest Service, the Forest Health Protection Branch, stationed at the Forestry Sciences Lab in Wenatchee. Betsy has a master's degree in ecology from Colorado State University, and she earned her PhD in forest science from Northern Arizona University. Her interest in forest pathology began when she surveyed white pine blisters across Colorado and Wyoming in 2003. And the study of important pathogen has been her passion ever since. White pine blister rust is one of several disturbances that threaten the health and the persistence of white pine across North America. So this evening, uh, Betsy will tell us about the complicated interactions of white bark pine and blister rust. And with that, um, thank you, Betsy, for being here and um, looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, Connie. I am honored to be here. I really appreciate the invitation. And I just wanna check that you can all see my screen okay. Yes. Okay. Let's see, can I get rid of this at the top? Maybe not. Okay, let's just go ahead. So again, thank you for the invitation. I am really looking forward to talking with you today. Um, Anybody that lets me talk about white pine blister rust for 45 minutes um, in my book is great because it's something I love talking about. Okay. All right, moving on. Um, I did want to spend just a minute at the top here and tell you a little bit more about me and my connections to the five needle pine group of which white bark pine is um, a member of. As Connie mentioned, I started out um, surveying for white pine blister rust in Colorado and Wyoming. That was on um, Pinus flexilis. Sorry, I'm gonna hide this video here. So Pinus flexilis um, limber pine. It has a broad distribution across Colorado and Wyoming. Those are some of the photos over here. We're collecting cones from that species. Here I am with a, a llama named Farquhar at Rocky Mountain National Park. He helped us carry some cones down the mountain one day. I was also lucky enough to work in the Rocky Mountain bristlecone pine systems. Those are the photos you see over there on the right. That's me getting zen underneath an old skeleton of Rocky Mountain bristlecone pine. That's Pinus aristata. And then I moved even further south and um, I was working on southwestern white pine. And that's this tall tree in the middle that I'm attempting to climb here. Um, that's Pinus strobiformis. And I worked on the regeneration ecology, silviculture, and adaptive traits of that species. And so I very much love this group of pines, the five needle pines, and I do have strong connection to them. And I consider myself um, a learner in the white bark pine system. As Connie mentioned, I came here in 2015. And so I am really trying to get out into the white bark pine as much as I can and learn about white bark pine in the Pacific Northwest. So let's, let's get into white bark pine. So as many of you likely know, um, this is kind of a probably a, a repeat and, and these are things that you know about white bark pine, but it is considered a stone pine. It's the only stone pine we have in North America. So that's the subsection Sembre within the five needle pine group. And the five needle pine groups are grouped into the subgenus Strobus. So our five needle pine groups, we have our stone pines, foxtail pines and our soft pines. So white bark pine has a pretty wide distribution, as you can see in the map in the upper left there. Um, it's got a pretty wide distribution across Western North America. It's one of the more widely distributed five needle pines. But here in the Cascades in Washington and Oregon, it's, it's fairly limited along the Cascade Crest. Um, some smaller populations, as, especially as you get down into Oregon. Although we have some pretty good populations in Northern Washington. But the main elevation range in the Pacific Northwest is about 5,200 to 9,200 feet, although you can certainly find it growing um, at lower elevations and probably some higher elevations. 
um, Connie and I have worked on a plot where it was at 4,000 feet, and that was over in the Selkirk Mountains in northeastern Washington. So the associations where it occurs, they're going to range from being in the upper subalpine mixed forest. So often it's co-occurring with subalpine fir, lodgepole pine, maybe mountain hemlock as you get further south, um, maybe even shasta fir as you get down in southern Oregon. Um, to more dominance at the higher elevation. And it does well at those higher elevations and it's usually more of a dominant tree species there, not because it likes to grow there, but because it can grow there and it's not a great competitor and other species cannot grow there. So I'm guessing that this group knows that white bark pine is considered to be a very ecologically important species. We call it a keystone species. And what that means is essentially it's disproportionately important to the ecosystem for the amount that's on the landscape. So removing white bark pine from the system would have cascading event, uh, ecological effects. And so white bark pine is known to, to um, retain snowpack. There are vegetation, vegetation dynamics at play. It's a nurse tree for other species. Um, and it has really important associations uh, with wildlife species, such as grizzly bear, black bear, Clark's nutcracker, and some of our squirrel species because it has large nutritious seeds. So it's a very important on the landscape. There are threats to the sustainability of white bark pine forests um, across its range. In December, 2020, there was a proposal from the US Fish and Wildlife Service uh, proposing to list the species as threatened and under the Endangered Species Act. Um, those four main threats to white bark pine forests um, are listed here. One of those is white pine blisterus, and that is a disease caused by a non-native pathogen. There's also the threat of mountain pine beetle, and mountain pine beetles are a native insect. Um, they have coexisted with the white bark pine for a very long time, but they certainly can kind of blow up in populations and kill trees at epidemics. In, in epidemics every now and then, and in some areas, especially the northern Rockies, they're found that um, they're killing trees at the higher elevation more so than, than known um, in the recent history that we know about. Altered fire regimes also affect white bark pine. Altered, or I'm sorry, the, the, the fire issue with white bark pine is interesting. White bark pine does need a disturbance such as fire um, to, re it does well regenerating in disturbed areas such as those cleared by fire. Um, but also too many large severe fires at high elevations um, are going to kill the mature trees and um, kill the seed sources for those. And so too much fire is not a good thing on the landscape, but also the lack of fire on the landscape has been an important um, stressor to white bark pine. Um, that those low severity fires can actually clear out some of the competitor species such as subalpine fir or lodgepole. And so a lack of fire on the landscape has certainly affected the health of white bark pine as well. So there really is this sweet spot with fire when it comes to white bark pine. The last topic is sort of uh, the big one, the elephant in the room, changing climate. Um, white bark pine probably could do well on its own with a changing, with some warmer, longer growing seasons. It's got a wide distribution. Um, it could probably handle that, but when the, the changing climate interacts with these different disturbance agents, it, um, it could really be bad for the future of white bark pine. Over here on the left, this figure is showing, there was this recent analysis, it was 2016 analysis. They took 1400 plots from our nationwide forest inventory and analysis network. They took 1400 plots with white bark pine in them. And what they found when they looked at the data was that 51% of the um, you know, uh, mature white bark pine or at least five inches diameter white bark pine, 51% on the landscape was dead. And so the um, live white bark pine were not, um, were, not, were not outnumbering the dead ones on the landscape essentially. And so obviously there's more, um, areas that have more mortality, so that's percent live BA or basal area, which is just a measure of density. In the Northern Rockies, they have some areas where there's a lot of mortality. Here in the Pacific Northwest, we're in that 50 to 70 percent range. But there's a lot of variability in there as well. So let's focus in a little bit on white pine blisterus. 
This is a disease caused by a fungus called Conertium ribicola. This is not native to, to North America. This was introduced into North America in a couple different introductions. So the Northeastern states and Canada, it was introduced um, multiple times from Europe um, as early as 1898. In Western North America, so this is a completely separate introduction. It hasn't worked its way from the East, but it was introduced into Western North America um, on a shipment of seedlings from France. And we think we know exactly when it, where it was um, introduced to. It's a place called Point Grey right outside of Vancouver. And it's thought that that occurred in 1910. And we're gonna get into that story a little bit because I think it's pretty interesting. So the origin of the fungus is presumed to be Asian, Eurasian, um, and Pinus sembrae and Pinus siberica, um, some of the sort of early hosts of the species. Um, so all of our native five needle pines in North America are susceptible. All of them except Great Basin bristlecone pine, Pinus longeva, have been found to be infected in the field. So white pine blisterus has, has had major impacts to our commercial white pine species, and those are eastern white pine, western white pine, and sugar pines. But we also know now, um, and we didn't know, you know, in the early 1900s when, because the focus was really on the commercial species, but now we really start to understand that the mortality to these high elevation species, such as white bark pine, have those cascading ecological consequences for the things that we just kind of talked about, the snowpack, wildlife, and those vegetation dynamics. So the spread of blisterus throughout North America, I think is an interesting story. And so I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on this, and this is sort of an overview. So on the right, we're looking at a map and it's showing the different colors are the different decades of infestation. And so the, area of the first introduction in Western North America is right here, point gray, um, and the red is the first few decades of that spreading. You can see that by 1940, it has spread throughout most of the Pacific Northwest. So the disease wasn't actually recognized in Western North America until it was found outside Vancouver in 1921. So all the information we know about when it came in in 1910 and what happened from 1910 to 1921 is sort of a retrospective look at what happened. By the time it was introduced and by the time it was found, it, white pine blisteros was already well known amongst Canadian and um, United States forest pathologists. So it had been in the East for a few years um, and it was widespread across Europe by 1900. So the reason it was widespread across Europe is because they were growing a lot of eastern white pine, which is native to eastern North America, but they were growing Pinus strobus or eastern white pine for reforestation across Europe. Um, and so because the fungus is um, from Eurasian area and it was on the Asian and European pines, it actually sort of took off on the eastern white pine that they had imported from us. So in turn, um, France used to grow, France and Germany especially used to grow a lot of eastern white pine seedlings and ship them over here. So that's actually how the fungus got over here. It was introduced to this landowner on, in Point Grey um, on a shipment of eastern white pine seedlings from France in 1910. And you couldn't see that they were infected in the time. They were two-year-old seedlings, but um, they turned out to be infected and that's essentially where the fungus spread has, has spread from. And so that is sort of the story in the Pacific Northwest that we've had this one introduction, but I, I'm, I have to be honest and say that, um, although it's a really good story, that story is a little, has been challenged recently. There are geneticists and some people that think there were probably multiple introductions in the Pacific Northwest, but we don't really have enough evidence to sort of piece that together into how that happened. So before we talk about the spread anymore, so we are going to come back to that story and focus a little bit more on the spread of the fungus um, through the Pacific Northwest and specifically to white bark pine. But in order to understand why that occurred, it's important that we understand the biology of this fungus, which I think is also a pretty good story. It's a pretty interesting system. So Conartium ribicola is an obligate parasite, so it needs living hosts. 
um, to complete its four stages in its life cycle. It's a fairly complex system. It involves five spore stages and two hosts. So we have our pine hosts, um, and then we have an alternate host, which are one of three genera of plants. Here you see the ribes species, a ribes leaf there. And so each of those four stages um, requires some specific temperature and humidity requirements or environmental windows in order for the spores to germinate um, and spread. So we consider this kind of a cool wet disease. It likes cooler temperatures. It does better in kind of these cooler temperature windows. And several of the spore stages require quite a bit of a very high relative humidity or, or even free water and um, a lengthy period of time. So in general, the infection on the pines um, occurs through the needle stomates. So we're gonna walk through the um, life cycle, but just in general, you get spores from these alternate hosts, they're wind dispersed, they will land on the pine needles, they will grow into the stomates of the needles, the fungus will then move down the needles through hyphae, just through hyphal growth, um, and it will get into the branch or the stem tissue. And so this is sort of a, a nice diagram of the life cycle of Cornartium radicula. Again, we can start here at the top. We have these basidia spores. Those are gonna be on our alternate hosts. And those are either Ribes, Pedicularis, or Castilea species. In this photo, we have Ribes. Those basidia spores are gonna be wind dispersed over to our pines. Within about six months or a year, we're gonna get our first spore stage, Spermatia. And then those are gonna get, that's sort of equivalent to a pollination in a flower. So those are gonna get kind of moved around by insects. And then the next year um, we'll get spores, and that's the telltale blisters with the rusty color in them. And that's where the fungus gets its name. Then the spores are going to be wind dispersed again, back to those alternate hosts and they will land on that alternate host, invade through a stomate, and then another spore will appear when those conditions are right. And those are known as uridinia spores. This is where the fungus builds up. Um, those uridinia spores don't go anywhere. They essentially just, when conditions are right, when it's these cool kind of wet um, days, and this is in the summer, so you can, sometimes that happens a lot and sometimes it doesn't happen very much at all. This is usually like June, July, depending on your, your um, elevation but the uridinia spores are just gonna keep infecting the ribes and cycle there. So you can start with just a few leaves of a ribes bush being infected, and then all of them can be infected in a couple of weeks. So then from the uridinia spores, we get telia spores. Those don't go anywhere either. Those actually bear the cydia spores. And then we're back at the top of the cycle. Those are gonna go back to the pines. And so just kind of to, show these in a little bit more detail, maybe too much detail. I don't know, I can, I can talk about this all day, but um, just to sort of break this down a little bit more. So those basidia spores um, coming in from the ribes, landing on those needles, you to kind of get these spots and things on the needles. This is a photo of the fungus actually invading the needle, coming in through the needle stomate. And so you can see that a couple of places here, the fungus has germinated, it has grown into the needle. Then it's going to grow down that needle tissue um, with the hyphae, and it's going to eventually get into this the phloem of the tree, essentially that the inner phloem. Um, so once it's grown down here, you can see this um, branch actually it looks kind of lumpy and swollen. That's just the fungus building up there underneath that the the tissue, um, the woody tissue, and um, it gets kind of this orangey cast too. And these are the spermatia that will be visible outside of the, the bark. And those are gonna be enclosed in these little um, kind of wet dots and um, like dew drops uh, outside the, the bark. And so from those um, spermatia, the next year essentially, um, usually, um, we're gonna get our acea developed or our blisters in the same place that those spermatia were. And so um, that's again, where the fungus gets its name. These acea are the blisters and they contain these acea spores that are these you know, orangey like Cheeto dust, okay? 
So from the pines, when the conditions are right, these are going to just be dispersed in the wind and they're going to have to find an alternate host. Again, we're showing Ribes here, but this could be Pedicularis or Castilea. So the ACS spores leave the pine and go to their alternate host where they um, use a stomate to get into that leaf tissue. And again, so with, this is the Uridinia spores and that's what they look like. They're these kind of rusty pustules um, on the back of the Ribes leaves. Um, and again, this is where the cycle kind of builds up. So the, the Uridinia spores um, can reinfect Ribes leaves. It can have up to like seven generations in one season. So you can really get an increase in the disease presence here. So on those same leaves where the Uridinia were is where we get those telia formations. And this is called a telial um, horn or a telial column. And this is, you'll see these later in the summer if you flip the leaves over that are infected, um, you'll see these little telial hairs. So then at the top of these hairs, um, these telial hairs, we get a, yet another spore stage developed. We get a basidia developing, which you can see here. And it's got these four little basidia spores that are gonna be born on those. Those are again, gonna get wind dispersed. The cycle continues. Those basidia spores are going back to the pines, landing on those needles and growing down the needle tissue into the pines. So once they sort of get onto you, into the branch tissue, you're gonna see canker expansion, both towards the stem and away from the stem, as well as um, it can go um, basically up towards the top of the tree, or sometimes we'll go a little bit down as well. And so each year, these cankers are perennial and they're gonna grow from the margins each year to expand on the pines. And so that's what those arrows are indicating. So, you know, this year we've got kind of this edge of the canker and then next year it might be a couple inches higher. So also we'll see those different spore stages. So this is um, a blisterous canker here. We're seeing the spermacea at the margin of the canker. So, but then next year we'll have more acea here and you're seeing kind of those acea blisters up here towards the center of the canker. So that's kind of a wrap up of, of the biology of this fungus. So um, again, some of the important points are that the fungus essentially does, it needs two hosts. Um, there's no pine to pine spread, luckily. And also the spore production and the germination and the spread doesn't necessarily happen every year because those conditions need to be right. And, they're not gonna be right every year, but because the cankers on those pines are perennial, um, there's, a real, there's usually a pretty good amount of ACS spores that are there to kind of start that cycle if it's a good year. When it is a good year and all those things align and we get big buildup of uridinia spores um, and the basidia spores get back to, there's a lot of basidia spores to get back to the pines. We call those wave years of pine infections. You can often see in a stand if there was a wave year recently because there'll be a lot of cankers kind of on the same years of growth um, or the past few years of growth and the cankers are about the same size. So in the literature, some people sort of refer to what happened in the Pacific Northwest introduction of C. ribicola as um, a perfect storm. And so I do want to get back into kind of um, how this spread occurred and, and what were some of the, the factors that led to such a fast spread throughout Washington and Oregon. So first it was, it was known that point, in, again, retrospectively, Point Grey was considered one of the worst possible sites to introduce this fungus into the West. Um, it's right at the mouth of the Fraser River and it's subject to these prevailing winds from the west and the southwest. And so now that you know about the fungus, you know that those winds are certainly going to take some of our spores to some of those alternate hosts. And those winds apparently blow right up past Point Grey up the Fraser River Valley. Another reason that it did so well in the Pacific Northwest are that ribes are, are and were very abundant and many species were present. I don't know how many species um, of Ribes there are in the Pacific Northwest, and I would love it if somebody would share that at the end, but I did read that there's at least 21 native species in Washington alone. Another reason there was such a perfect storm is because there was Ribes nigrum everywhere, or the black currant, and that's a cultivated species, um, not common, 
but it was very, I'm sorry, not common, not native, um, but it was very common, especially in Southern British Columbia at the time, because European settlers had brought it with them because it was part of their culture. Um, and so there was Ribes nigrum um, throughout the Pacific Northwest. Now Ribes nigrum happens to be one of the most susceptible to rust infection. Um, and it produces a large amount of those basidia spores. And so we have a, an abundant, um, very susceptible alternate host. And then um, Western white pine at the time was a relatively common tree species used in a lot of plantation and commercial forestry. And that's what you see um, the range here with the uh, horizontal lines is Western white pine. And then we get down into sugar pine. So I have a few slides that kind of walk through, and I don't know if everyone can, this is covered up, but I've got the dates up here in the upper right-hand corner, and I'm gonna walk through a few slides that just um, show in detail some of the known pine infection centers that they were finding these different years. And you can see um, how quickly it was spreading once it was um, introduced in 1910. So this is 1913. The red circle indicates our um, place of introduction. And by 1913, you can see there are already a number of these triangles, which are areas of known pine infection centers. And it was thought that they established in 1913. So those seedlings must have put out spores in that first um, spring in order for those infections to have occurred by 1913. Whoops, I'm not. Sorry for the delay. We're not. Oops, there we go. Okay, so I've got our 1913 here. This is the 1917 and 1918. Um, these are the known pine infections then. I'll flip back and forth here. You can see how many more of these um, triangles we have. Also notable is that in um, the interior mountains of British Columbia, we have known infections. We also have known infections in Northwestern Washington on the peninsula and one in Oregon. If we look at 1920 and 1921, again, we've got um, quite a spread and the circles are centers of previously known origin. So, they're not new ones, but all of the um, triangles are new introductions. We're down into the Mount Adams, maybe Mount Rainier areas in here at the peninsula. Um, and again, more in the interior mountains. By 1923, this is a, this is a um, area of general pine infection now. Um, again, we've got more infections on the peninsula in North um, West Washington and the interiors. And this is where there was a lot of infections first popped up in the Northern Rockies and Northern Idaho. 1927 and 1928, I thought was a good year to show because you can see how quickly the corn started spreading um, in Northern Idaho. And we have a lot more infections in Oregon by this time as well. By 1936, they'd sort of just put a line around the, the western white pine in, on the west side at least, and called this an area of general pine infection. Um, and these circles here are uh, basically known, I'm sorry, new surveys of the infection on ribes at the time. So again, the, um, uh, okay, I'll just back up. So, so specifically to white bark pines, some notes on like the spread within the Pacific Northwest. Um, most of those surveys that were being done um, starting in 1921, when they found out it had been in Western North America, um, were probably on Western white pine, um, just because that was an accessible species and that was a commercial species and it was of great importance. But there are some notes if you look back in the in the literature of white bark pine. So in 1922, white bark pine was found on a white bark pine at the University of British Columbia um, Arboretum. In 1926, Lackman reported finding blister rust in a natural stand of mixed white bark and western white pine. And he reported that white bark pine appeared far more susceptible than those co-occurring Western white pines. 
And so by that, he meant that more of the white bark pine were infected, and there were also more cankers per tree on the white bark pine. So in the 1930s, they observed white pine blister rust on white bark pine. I'm sorry, they did some surveys in, in the 1930s to actually start looking at the white bark pine. They were finding it in northern in Mount Hood area, northern Oregon, um, and some of these areas in southern and central Washington, uh, Mount Adams, Mount Rainier. These surveys were showing a very high infection rate in white bark pine, um, anywhere from 70 to 100% of the trees were infected. Um, if you look at their table at those five or six sites, not only were a lot of trees infected, they, were, they had a lot of cankers. And so anywhere from three to 30 times more can, um, cankers were found on white bark pine um, than those co-occurring Western white pine. Another note I found specific to white bark pine is that um, there were some surveys in the Sunrise area of Mount Rainier in 1952, and they found that about 50% of those white bark were infected. And so now we know that the white bark pine um, have been challenged by this fungus um, from anywhere from probably 60 to 80 to 90 years. So one of the early thoughts of, of controlling it was to eradicate, just get rid of one of the alternate hosts so it couldn't complete its life cycle. And so there was a lot of time and money put into Ribe's eradication efforts. Um, that was a principal control approach for a while. Um, so they were essentially using herbicides to eradicate the Ribe species, herbicides and manual labor. And that's what you can see um, the folks here have these backpack, backpack spray, sprayers walking through these huge swaths of ribes. Um, so they did focus on ribes nigrum and were pretty successful by the mid 1920s in removing ribes nigrum. And then they were focusing on the wild species. So the goal was to remove those ribes within 300 meters of the pines um, that were trying to be protected. So if it was kind of a high value stand, they would try to get it within a couple hundred meters knowing that complete removal was not going to happen, but trying to get as many as they can. So out west, it was sort of difficult to duplicate the success that they were having in the east. There was differences in terrain. Um, there, was difference, there was differences when you think about how ribes are a pioneer species that come in um, post-fire. And some of these areas, especially in the northern Rockies, um, had some big fires previous decades. And so it just became not really worth the effort to do it, um, event, especially because other control efforts um, started to become more prevalent. And the correlation between the, the amount of ribes and the infection on the pines was sort of starting to break down. And so other, other control efforts, including pruning, silviculture, and genetic resistance, which we'll talk about in a few slides, uh, became more prevalent. There are still restrictions on cultivating ribe species in some states though. Oops. Now I wanna talk a little bit more about the alternate hosts, which I usually don't, um, I usually kind of breeze by um, the alternate hosts, but because this is a native plant society presentation, I thought that um, this audience might be interested in talking about the alternate hosts a little bit more. So we know that ribes are the most prevalent alternate host in the Pacific Northwest, but Naturally occurring Carnassium ribicola infections have been observed on a couple Pedicularia species and a couple Castilea species as well. Um, it's not totally surprising that Pedicularia and Castilea are known to be alternate hosts because they are hosts um, in Europe and Asia, but we didn't know they were hosts in Western North America until 2007. So this is sort of um, recent um, events happening where we figured out that it wasn't just ribes as the alternate host um, in Western North America. And we're still trying to kind of figure out how much these Pedicularis and Castilea species are contributing to disease on the landscape. It's thought that they're kind of a minor component of the disease process on these landscapes. Um, but, but more work needs to be done to really, to really get to that answer. There was a great study in 2009, specific to white bark pine, that was looking at the three major genera um, alternate hosts in these six sites across Washington and Oregon. 
And they did find natural infections of Pedicularis and Castilea species um, by this fungus at four of those sites. And that's where you see those red arrows are the ones that had natural infections of those two. Um, but it was at very low frequency. It was anywhere from like 1% to 2.5% of those plants. Whereas they were finding ribes um, were infected in about 10% of the plots. So it's still thought that ribes is probably contributing the most to disease in the Pacific Northwest, but um, it certainly is being, um, the disease is occurring on these other alternate hosts. So some other notes about ribes, and I wanted to show a few photos here, just in case any of you are interested in being, when you're out in the field, kind of looking for this rust on the ribes. Um, from the top of the ribes leaf, you'll, if you see it infected, uh, sometimes you won't see that it's infected from the top. Sometimes it'll still you know, be green and you'll have to flip the leaf over. But if you see it kind of later in the summer, you'll start to get some kind of flecking and, and chlorotic and necrotic patches on the top of the ribes leaf. And if you flip them over, if you see kind of a mat of um, sort of short little spores, those are probably your, your adenia spores. And then if it's a little bit later in the summer, you might see those little telial hairs on the back of the leaf. So a few other notes about ribes in Washington and Oregon. As we've talked about, the ribes nigrum um, is where the Cronarchium ridicola was um, first detected in um, Pacific Northwest. But other important and abundant native ribes um, are Lacustra, Bracteosum, Divericatum, and Sanguinium. Of those, Bracteosum was considered very important in, west of the Cascade Crest for early establishment of blisteras, and it continues to be a major susceptible host for the disease. And then east of the Cascade Crest, um, the more, most important species for disease spread is thought to be ribes and nermi. There are a few cultivars of ribes, um, the red currant cultivars apparently called Viking and Red Dutch. Those are practically immune. Um, and so it would be good to plant those if you wanted to plant ribes. And then out of all of the ribes native to Western North America, um, Hudsonianum is considered the most susceptible. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about what contemporary blister rust infections on white bark pine in the Pacific Northwest look like. These are some of the consequences of white pine blister rust. Um, again, we can get, um, once it gets into the branch tissue or the stem of the tree, we might get top kill. We can get whole tree mortality. Um, it can kill seedlings very quickly because of their size. But before the tree dies, we're getting a loss of cone crop. Um, and we're getting a dieback in the system. So the contemporary levels of blister rust, I think these are getting cut off here. I don't know if I can move this down. We'll try to move this around a little bit. Um, on the left, the map we have our um, blister rust are the percent of stems of white bark pine infected by white pine blister us in some 2004 and 2005 surveys. And so you can see we're ranging from, you know, 25% up to 73% in some areas. In general, we have more infection in Washington than we do in Oregon. And once you get down more east of the Cascade Crest, especially like the Fremont Wynema forest, um, we have white bark pine that is not infected by white pine blister us. Over on the right, I'm showing a map of some current data that we've um, collected over the past, I don't know, this is 15 years or 13 years or something like that, maybe. Um, again, we have some very hot, some plots with very high blister rust, over 60% um, of those stems are infected, but we also have a lot of variation. Um, in Oregon, we're seeing some of those areas have higher infection, and I should say that these kind of warmer colors and larger um, shapes here are gonna be more infection. Uh, we still have no infection down in um, South Central Oregon. And now we have some more information like on the Malheur National Forest, and they have pretty low um, numbers of infection, but certainly have blister us there as well. So how fast does this occur? Um, how fast does white pine blister has caused this mortality and, and how fast does it cause changes to the landscape? Um, so I wanted to show 
these data sets from our partners um, at the National Park Service. This is a great study by Rushford et al. in 2018, where they have been looking at these, they've set up a permanent plot network across two of the parks in Washington, Mount Rainier and North Cascades, and they followed these trees over time. And so they recently completed an analysis looking at their data from 2004 to 2015, 16. What we're looking at here are cumulative newly dead trees on the y-axis and then the years on the x. And um, you, what I wanted to show with this was that at some sites where the disease pressure is very high, we're getting a lot of mortality over 10, 11 years, anywhere from up to them from 50% of new mortality, of cumulative new mortality. So that's just saying that in 11 years, half of the trees that you started with might be dead. And these are this is mostly caused by blister rust. This isn't um, bark beetles. But I also wanted to show that there's some sites that that mortality is less um, and that's not occurring as quickly. Um, maybe those sites have more resistant trees. I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, there's a lot of reasons why there could be more um, trees surviving on the landscape, but I did want to show just kind of this range and variation and how quickly this can occur. So there's a lot of strategies and talking about restoration of white bark pine. This is a screenshot of the cover of the restoration strategy specifically for the Pacific Northwest region, although we do have a range wide strategy and the white bark and we're all there's also a nationwide strategy being developed now. Overall, the goals of these are to restore and conserve a network of viable populations of white bark pine and their associated species across the PNW. And so what that entails is kind of going out, evaluating the health and status of these stands. We wanna increase our understanding of the threats, find out where they are and develop solutions and for restoration, trying to protect genetic resource through gene conservation, um, trying to get blister rust resistance out into the white bark pine population and restore degraded habitats. So for the last few minutes, I just wanted to focus on this topic increasing blister rust resistance in white bark populations and tell you a little bit more about that. So I'll have to back up and tell you a little bit more about genetic resistance. And it's thought that genetic resistance is really important to sustaining five needle pines on the landscape. Um, you, you, the Forest Service initiated a rust resistance breeding program that started in the 1940s um, and got really um, quite serious in the 1950s. This was all based on the apparent existence of natural resistance out in the field. And so what they would do essentially is go out into the field and they would find trees in an area, so in an area, in a stand that had blister rust and had been, um, and, and blister rust was in the stand, they would find trees that didn't have any cankers and didn't have any blister rust. And so they were wondering, okay, are these traits heritable? Is this something that we can pass on? Is this a form of genetic natural resistance that can be passed on um, to the offspring? And we can kind of harness this and use it for restoration. And so that breeding program that the Forest Service started um, really started out looking at Western white pine. It's developed, then it started looking at sugar pine, uh, but now all of our species of five needle pines are basically in these breeding programs and we're constantly looking for resistance um, in the various species of five needle pines. And so essentially there's two types of resistance. Um, one of them is called major gene per resistance. This is controlled by one to few genes. Um, and essentially what this is, and this will, without getting too complicated, um, I just want to explain what this is. If you have this gene, and here that would be um, denoted by a big R, um, you're essentially this this family, this needle, is essentially um, walling off the fungus once it gets infected. So this is called a hypersensitive response. When those spores, those basidia spores from an alternate host, land on the pine needle. Um, this cell death occurs. And so these resistant families or trees are not allowing the fungus to grow in their needle tissue. We know that's controlled by um, a single gene, which is why it's called major gene for resistance. Just one moment. <laughs> 
So we have major gene for resistance, and then we have another type of resistance, and that's um, generally called partial or quantitative resistance. And so this, these are traits that um, help the tree or the family survive the rust, but they're not necessarily doing this hypersensitive response and, and walling off that rust, the spore, right when it tries to invade. So there's many genes involved in this type of resistance. Um, some of those I have listed here. So those could be needle shedding traits, those could be reduced needle lesion frequency, and that might because, be because there's some chemical differences with the needles. Um, that can be a slow canker growth. Those can be bark healing processes where it's actually um, producing some chemicals in the cells to keep that canker from growing. And there's a few other traits um, that would be described, that would describe that partial or quantitative resistance. And so that is, those are the type of traits found so far in white bark pine. So major gene for resistance has not been found in white bark pine, but we have found um, these partial or quantitative resistant traits. And I'm gonna skip that because I think I'm um, getting close to the end here. But um, I, so for the process of harnessing that natural genetic resistance um, is pretty simple. You're going out, you're finding these quality candidate trees. Um, again, you're looking in areas that have rust and you're looking for trees that don't have rust. And then we are climbing, caging, and collecting the cones on those trees. And they have to be caged so that um, the birds and the squirrels don't get them. Um, and then you're actually inoculating the seedlings, which means that you're essentially just giving those seedlings the disease. And we're gonna follow those seedlings in disease trials to figure out which families have some resistance. These are some photos of that artificial inoculation process. In, here in region six, we use the Darena Genetic Resource Center down in Cottage Grove, Oregon, but there's also one of these in Coeur d'Alene um, as well. And so it's actually quite a simple, elegant uh, process. And, um, to artificially inoculate these seedlings. What they're doing is they're going out in the field or they have ribes gardens um, and they're finding ribes in the gardens or in the fields that are infected and are producing uridinia spores during the summer. Then they're laying these ribes leaves across these, basically these large screens um, and they're going to kind of pump this, war this um, cool, moist air into a chamber and um, the ribes leaves will essentially rain their basidia spores down onto the seedlings. So this photo on the left is showing you kind of a, a view from above the screens. The center photo is showing you a view from the seedlings um, below the screens. This photo on the right is showing the basidia spores just sort of getting rained down on all of these seedlings and someone's holding out a slide there to try to get a spore density. And so that's the process of artificially inoculating the seedlings with the disease. So once you do that, um, you take the seedlings and you just kind of grow them over time and you spend a lot of time looking at the traits and doing repeated measures. You're looking for spots, you're looking for cankers, you're, look, you're counting cankers. Eventually you're, these families are gonna kind of segregate and you will find which families survive and which families don't survive. And so that's the process of finding these resistant families um, in the disease screening trials. So about 1500 of these families of white bark pine in Oregon and Washington have been tested for resistance. And when we find families that have um, traits and a, a high percentage of um, the traits for resistance, they're called elite families. Um, and here on the map on the right, those elite families are gonna be in the cooler colors. So the green and the blue, um, we rate them with this rating system of A, B, C, D, E, F. A's and B's are our highest resistance. So across the Pacific Northwest, there's about 220 trees identified as elite so far. I will say we've lost anywhere at least 30, maybe 50 of those to fire and um, mountain pine beetle by now. But that resistance is going to vary across the landscape. Um, there are some hot spots of resistance. You can see the Gifford Pinchot, Mount Rainier area, Mount Hood have a lot of those cool colors. So uh, uh, several families of resistance. And then up in the northeastern Washington and the Selkirk Mountains, um, there's quite a bit of resistance as well. 
And this is an ongoing process. So the goals are essentially to find and produce the most resistant families for reforestation and restoration. And you wanna combine that with using the, the most locally adapted families with the resistant families. Um, and you can outplant those in high priority areas to increase the resistant white bark pine on the landscape. Those high priority areas can be whatever the land manager says is high priority. That's often um, after a burn or maybe a bark beetle outbreak or something like that, areas that you would want to plant white bark pine. So there's a lot of outplanting white bark happening. Um, I didn't get the numbers together to have an, a good number of the acres or the amount of projects in Washington. I wish I had. Um, but we do have operational outplantings where people are planting after fires and then some research trials where um, this is a Washington DNR project. And this is the location of these trials across Washington. We're essentially watching um, these trees over time and making sure the rust kind of holds up out in the real world. And then these are the seed zones for white bark pine in Washington. And again, the goal is just to get enough elite trees, uh, elite families within these various seed zones that we have enough locally adapted stock to use for restoration purposes. And so I will end there and um, I will just leave you with this slide of various people um, doing various work in the white bark pine habitat. You may recognize um, Connie Mamel, some of these photos <laughs> looking at for beetles uh, in the trees. And I just wanted to end by saying, you know, I don't know what the future of white bark pine is um, in the Pacific Northwest, but what I do know, what is a fact, is that the future of white bark pine certainly includes many passionate people out there doing a lot of good work um, with, with climbing trees and caging cones, protecting trees, learning about the resource, and implementing these restoration projects. So thank you for your time. I hope I didn't go over. I tend to talk a lot when it comes to blister rust. Um, I will leave you with some photos of this beautiful fungus out in the field and I'm happy to have a discussion and, and hear any questions. Betsy, thank you so much. That, that was terrific. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate it. Um, I, I was very interested in your discussion about the various alternate hosts. And um, I have a couple of questions if you if you have some time to answer. Um, one of them is on uh, about one of the earlier maps you showed in your presentation. Um, why is the percent live base area so high? That's for white bark pine. Why is it so high in the Sierra Nevada? Get far south it is. Well, um, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, there's Connie is probably going to have to help me answer this question. Um, there are areas of the Sierra Nevadas that the white bark pine has only recently been invaded by the white pine blister rust. There's some implications of climate change there where we are seeing that climate change is starting to impact the white bark pine, but it doesn't seem to have gotten um, as far high up in elevation uh, there as it has further north. Now, part of that might also be the bark beetle situation that they, and I, I think I will lob that to you, Carney, about not having that um, pressure down there as, as much as we do up here and in the Northern Rockies. You're right, it didn't separate the cause of mortality, whether it was blister rust or, um, or bark beetle. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that, that's probably the explanation. And then another question, uh, the disease, um, pine blister rust, has mortality in the alternate hosts, or is it mostly cosmetic? Um, it does not seem to cause mortality because those, le those plants will drop their leaves. And so they will drop their infections and then they'll start over fresh the next spring. And we don't generally see um, dieback caused by that. Um, in Ribe's plants, at least. I really don't know for Castellea or Pedicularis. Okay, so it, so it is mostly cosmetic or um, yeah. best of growth, growth reduction. Yeah. Okay, 
All right, so uh, someone is saying, um, it's interesting that the trees on the Fremont Wynema um, don't have a high genetic resistance and yet they have zero infection rate. So um, do you have any explanation for that? <laughs> Well, I really meant to reach out to some of my counterparts further south to, to ask, like, why do you think that they don't have rust down there? Um, so part of the reason they might not have resistance is because they haven't been challenged, right? And so um, it's, it's a, it is a slow process, but we do know that when these trees are challenged with rust, those susceptible ones are gonna die pretty quickly and you're gonna be left with those resistant trees. Now, whether that has happened in Washington, whether we've had enough time for that process to happen is kind of up in the air. But also when you're picking trees to test, if you don't have any rust, you don't have any like putatively, you don't have any clean trees to choose, right? So you, if all your trees are clean, you're really doing a blind sampling of that. And so if you go into a stand and there's no rust and you just pick 10 random trees, you're not as likely to find the resistant families in that stand. Whereas if you're up in Washington and you're in a stand that has had blister rust for 70 years, you can find those clean trees. Those are more likely to be resistant. So that doesn't do anything but maybe pose more questions, but that's, just, that's sort of my thoughts on the free one. Fremont Wine right. area. And I think they're just too dry, maybe like too far east of the crest. They, it seems to be an environmental escape down there. I don't, I don't fully understand why blister rust isn't there because it's in some pretty dry places. Like I mentioned, I used to survey for it in like Wyoming and, you know, I mean, that's, that's dry. So not really sure why it's not down there. Well, Mexico has five needle pines too. And I don't believe that blister rust has been found there, but I don't think it's because the are necessarily resistant. I oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. There's probably some environmental issues that are preventing it as well. Call those environmental escapes. Right. Okay, and I just have one question here. Um, how was it discovered which plants were the alternate hosts? Good question. <laughs> Do you know the answer? <laughs> I think so. I mean, I think it's just that, uh, so these rusts, I mean, these, it's, gosh, how am I going to back up and tell this question? I don't think I have a good answer for this, but um, these rust species, I mean, there are many of them and they are related and in the same order as like wheat stem rust and, and rust on pines, it's just known that some rusts um, have need multiple hosts and have like three to five spore stages. How they figured out exactly that it was ribes, I would assume it's because they found it on the ribes um, near a stand of the Western white pine, or not Western white, this would be over in Europe or Asia, um, and just noticed that close association. Um, and I guess if you if you knew a lot about rust, it, other rust species, you would know that you were looking for that alternate host because you know that the aceous spores can't infect other pines. That's the best I got with that one, but that's a really good question. I'm feeling kind of silly for not knowing that answer. <laughs> well, I, th I think it's true. I'm, I'm not an apologist, but most of the rusts do have some kind of alternate host. Is that, am I up there? Um, yeah, there are certainly, there are some pine rust, like Western gall rust that can go pine right. to pine. There's definitely autetious rust. Um, most of the pine stem rust do have an alternate host. Most of the rust in general, yeah, I would agree with that. Most of them have an alternate host. Yeah, okay, thanks. All right, I don't see any more questions. I see several um, thank yous in the chat, including one person who says, now I am passionate about white bark pine. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Betsy. I, I really appreciate your being here this evening. You're welcome. This was fun. Thanks for having me and thank you for the invite. And thanks for letting me talk about blister us for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um
Okay, I think I think we're done now. And uh, Denise, are you going to be the one to um, to close?